Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Valentino Stoll. Hey, Darren Bramer. Hey, everybody. Felipe Vogel. You're our guest. I was just on a roll and I just rolled right into you. You want to introduce <laughs> yourself real quick? Sure. My name is Felipe Vogel. I am a beginning Rubyist. Uh, I actually come from a humanities teaching background. And so I was a teacher until summer 2020. And at that point, I started my transition into software development. So currently, I uh, work in tech support as a tech support manager for a Shopify app company. That's mm. what I do by day. And by night, I hack away in Ruby and I build up my portfolio and such. I don't have any particular particular focus right now, but uh, I've built a few sites in Bridgetown and Rails, and I also enjoy building stuff in Pure Ruby. Awesome. Hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and lately I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast, and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story, about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs, why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs. But what I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv, and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are gonna help you to build the career that you want, right? So whether you wanna be an influencer in tech, whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever, I, I wanna give you the resources that are gonna help you do that. We're gonna have career and leadership resources in there, and we're gonna be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendevs.com. So it sounds like you might be looking for a Ruby job. I am, yes. That's starting today, I suppose. I'm looking for my first Rails job. Awesome. Well, he's going to sound super smart today, folks. So uh, if people want to hire you, we'll ask you for this info again. But if people want to hire you, how do they find you? Well, you can look on my website, fpsvogel.com, and you'll see contact methods there. Also, my GitHub same name, fpsvogel.com, and LinkedIn as well. Awesome. All right. Well, I guess I kind of skipped myself. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And yeah, we're going to talk about Bridgetown today. Now, you wrote an article on Bridgetown. And uh, yeah, this is a topic I've wanted to cover for a while. So I told uh, Michaela to find us somebody to come talk about it. And yeah, you kind of wrote this, hey, here's how you get started with Bridgetown. So you want to kind of give us the 10,000 foot view on what Bridgetown is and how it works, and then we can dive into what you've done with it because it, it, anyway it's super cool in my opinion but yeah sure so bridgetown is a static site generator similar to 11t or gatsby if you've heard mm -hmm. of those and it's actually a fork of jekyll which dates back to 2008 ancient times and uh, jekyll was written in ruby and uh, it was actually the first uh, big static site generator back in the day these days, it's uh, not been expanding as much, and so that's why Jared White, the creator of Bridgetown, decided to fork it, and uh, now it's taken on a life of its own. So it's it builds on Jekyll and adds a number of uh, updates to it, you know, a modern JS pipeline, uh, but also it has a lot of uh, Ruby-centric features, which are really neat, puts Ruby uh, in the limelight, which uh, is what, in my opinion... That uh, makes it really fun. Nice. Yeah. It, I mean, I remember when Jekyll came out and like everybody, it seemed like everybody was, it was like, oh, I'm going to blog on this bad boy. And then it seemed to go away and everybody moved off to like Hugo and stuff like that. Uh, Devchat.tv was actually hosted on Eleventy for a while. And anyway, so I've, I've kind of been around the block with some of these. I've played with Gatsby quite a bit, but. Gatsby has a huge overhead if you're trying to figure it out and you don't know React. And so I looked into Bridgetown and I was like, hey, this is Jekyll, except I don't have the maintenance nightmare of, hey, this is old stuff. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I, I thought, hey, well, let's get somebody on to talk about it and let people know that there's a Ruby option out there for statically generated blog focused or other statically uh, generated websites. Yeah, and one of the aims of Bridgetown is actually to uh, be more flexible than 
just a blog generator. And I know you can do a lot more with Jekyll too, but uh, Bridgetown sort of tries to break out of that mold and make it easier to to make uh, different kinds of sites than blogs. So I actually have not used uh, Jekyll before or Bridgetown, but could <gasps> you? I know. Darren. Full disclosure. So my question is, how would you compare it to other projects that are doing content management? Or it sounds like probably giving you a little more flexibility in terms of what you can do. And where do you where do you kind of see the sweet spot for a project like Bridgetown? Yeah. So I don't have a lot of experience with all the different tools, just as a disclaimer. But in Jekyll, the blog setup is the default. You know, how you access uh, data on the site is centered around blogs. And you can set it up that way in in Bridgetown. But they've added a, a resource approach where it's, you know, you're not looking at posts necessarily, but uh, resources, which could be uh, anything. And so you could more easily break out of the, the mold of a blog. For my site, I did build a blog, so I didn't explore all the uh, different options there. But I did build a an extra page on my blog where I keep my reading list. And that's where I explored some of the possibilities of Bridgetown, uh, specifically in building a Ruby component and a plugin behind that and, uh, you know, reaching out over an API to get data and add it into Bridgetown. So, Felipe, how is getting set up? Like, how was that process? Was it pretty smooth for you? Were there any hiccups along the way? I'm just trying to gauge kind of here, there, the onboard ramp to using Bridgetown right away. Yeah, it was pretty smooth. There, The only hiccups uh, that I encountered were in shifting over to a completely ERB setup where I'm, you know, writing my views in, sorry, IRB, I meant, uh, sorry, no, ERB, my tongue is tied. Uh, so the only the only hiccups I ran into were in setting up everything in ERB, uh, just like we do in Rails. But that's actually a pre-1.0 issue uh, in Bridgetown 1.0, which is coming out soon. Uh, it'll be, the defaults will be more beginner friendly and, and it'll be easier to set it up in whatever templating language you want. I just had to manually switch some things over just because it's it was still set up a bit like it was in, in Jekyll where Liquid was the default. And Oh, so, yeah, it was the default, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just walk us through kind of the whole process of how Bridgetown works as far as you set this up as a blog? Can you kind of walk us through all the steps that it took to kind of get your first post out into the public domain? Sure. I'll just give uh, an overview of my post here, how I set up my blog in Bridgetown. So Bridgetown has a nice getting started page on their site that gives the very first steps. And they're also going to redo their site soon. So it'll be even more friendly to those starting out. Uh, But it's pretty good uh, right now. Are they building it in Bridgetown? Oh, certainly. Yes. (laughs) Sorry, I I had to ask. (laughs) So the getting started page. And what I did next is I set up my CSS theme. I just used like a classless uh, CSS base, but you could do Bootstrap or something like that as well. And then there are a few plugins that are handy to have in a Bridgetown site. And I believe some of these will be included by default in 1.0 but I added some plugins for SEO tags, sitemap, atom feed, SVGs, stuff like that, and Turbo and Stimulus as well for, for my purpose. And then... Nice. Hang, hang on. I, I want to back you up just a little bit. So you're, you're pulling in Turbo and Stimulus so you can do other things with it. What's the process with that? Because a lot of the static site generators, I mean, even the JavaScript ones, if you try and pull in like some third-party JavaScript, some of them are a little bit tough to deal with. I mean, Gatsby, as long as it plays nicely with React, you're mostly okay. But like 11 some of the stuff, I mean, you kind of had to set up your own JavaScript build process. Otherwise, you were just kind of begging for trouble. No, actually, in Bridgetown, it's all set up already, as far as I can see. I mean, I didn't try using React uh, with it, but it does have a, like a you know standard Yarn pipeline and 
So for adding these plugins that I just mentioned, it's super easy. Uh, there are just simple commands that you run. Bundle exec Bridgetown configure turbo adds turbo. And same thing for, you know, with stimulus, adds stimulus. Um, oh, nice. So those are especially easy. But, you know, the, the JS pipeline is there for other things as well. And so after adding those plugins, then I switch to the resource content engine. That's what I mentioned earlier. That'll be the default in version one. They have a doc on the site that goes over it well. But you just have to set a setting in Bridgetown config for now to use the resource engine. Actually, I believe that it is the default now in the version after the, my tutorial. So that's not even necessary. And I had to also switch from Liquid to ERB, as I mentioned. I don't know if that's been added yet, but it, in 1.0, I believe it will be the default. And then finally, a couple of other cleaning up tasks in the Bridgetown config, uh, customize your permalink style and set up pagination as well for the blog posts. And then set your site's info, you know, SEO stuff. And I also added a pigments CSS theme for syntax highlighting. That was not too hard. What, what is the process for injecting custom CSS? Is that Was that a uh, like an NPM package or something like that that you just added? No, I actually downloaded a uh, CSS file from pigments, and then I uh, just imported it into the CSS index file. And so that was all the setup. After that, it was design and building my Ruby component, like I said. Huh. So how much customization did you have to do to the theme? Because I'm assuming it comes with a default theme. There is the theme that's used on the Bridgetown site, but uh -huh. I can't recall what the default theme is. I don't think there is a default at the moment. Okay. Uh, themes themes are somewhere where the Bridgetown maintainers are looking for help. Because uh, back in the day, you know, Jekyll had tons of themes. Right. He still has tons of themes. So that's something where I hope they'll grow in the coming years. But like I mentioned, I just downloaded a, a simple classless CSS base and used that for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really kind of curious to see where that all ends up. What I tend to do, by the way, and what I did for Eleventy was I just go to themeforest.net and I just pick up a theme there that I like and then I drop it in and then I wind up, yeah, doing the liquid or whatever, whatever the theming language is, right? So in this case, it would be ERB and then you just drop it in, customize those pieces in as you go. So one thing that I'm curious about is for your source, for your blog posts, are you just writing Markdown or? I am, yep, just writing Markdown. And actually, I can use my Ruby component straight in Markdown, which is oh, pretty really? neat. Yeah, so actually, one of the neat things about Bridgetown is, uh, like I said, Ruby is front and center. And so in your Markdown files, uh, you can actually use ERB directly, too. So that's what I do on my homepage, where I have you know my, my intro and then two lists, what I've been writing and what I've been reading. And under that is ERB, just looping through the most recent stuff, similar to how you would do in, in Jekyll with Liquid. But huh. uh, you can also, if you want something bigger, you can build a Ruby component, you know, uh, abstract it out and, and uh, include it that way. Very cool. I'm definitely going to have to dig into this and see what I can do with it. So it looks like you use Netlify for your deployments. And I, I see that it has a kind of a built-in configuration for that. Does it? Do you know if it has? If I want to deploy to Heroku or some other platform, are there other other components that are out there for that, or would I just kind of do that manually, or how would that work? That's a good question. I know that Jared, the creator of Bridgetown, does a lot on Render, so I'm sure it would be easy to uh, deploy on Render. Uh, I don't know about anything else though. Most yeah, of those no. systems, including Heroku, you can tell it what the build command is, and then you tell it what to serve from. And then it's got a generic web server in there that, yeah, you should be able to point to it that would know how to do HTML files. So I, I would guess that it wouldn't be terrible to figure out. Right. So is it using Webpack to manage its static assets then, or is it something else? Currently, I believe it is Webpack, yes. And more options are coming in uh, 1.0. Uh, actually, one not 1.0, but future one point something. This is really cool how you uh, customize the component for your reading list. 
where you're just kind of pulling from a, a CSV, which you have say you have in Dropbox? I do, yeah. So how does that Dropbox connection work? So I have my keys stored in Netlify, and this is yeah, this was a really fun part of the project. It's actually probably the mo- once I finished that part, it was the most uh, you know delightful moment probably in in all the Ruby I've done. But I, so I have my keys in in Netlify, and uh, my Ruby component in Bridgetown looks for those keys, and if it finds them, then it reaches out to a Dropbox account and gets the CSV file. And then uh, I've built a Ruby gem to parse the CSV. It's in a particular format for my reading list. And then it parses them into individual items. And then it takes the top rated items and stores them in Bridgetown's data. And then the component looks at the data, uh, passes it to the view. And then in the view, it's, it's shown as a list. And one other addition that I made to that, the cherry on top, is that later on I I set up a GitHub action to trigger a weekly Netlify build of my site. So that way, uh, my site rebuilds automatically every week. And so my reading list is updated automatically every week. So it's pretty cool to you know just be adding things into my reading list as I go along my week. And then all of a sudden, magically, they appear on my site. So that makes a static site feel more dynamic, at least in the mm-hmm. sense of, you know, it's being updated and changed and without your having to rebuild it manually. So we're we're using the term static, but you I think you had mentioned or I saw in your article that you're also are using the turbo and stimulus uh, configurations, I guess, that that kind of integrate in those capabilities. So how how are you able to use that on top of or how, how does that What's the paradigm in which you use that? How does that how does that work? Yeah, so Turbo, actually, I just dropped it in for snappier page transitions. Uh, I didn't do any customization there. And Stimulus, I'm using it just for some JavaScript uh, for my reading list. I have some filters and sorting options there, which work with some JavaScript sprinkles via Stimulus. And actually, so how much- I'm sorry, i uh, just uh, wanted to add that later I found out that if I wanted to, I could have written even my controllers in Ruby, my stimulus controllers in Ruby. There's a, a project, uh, Ruby2.js. It's also maintained by Jared White. And uh, with it, you can write your JavaScript in Ruby, basically. Kind of like Opal, if, you've, if you're familiar with that, except that mm-hmm. instead, of a, instead of a runtime, it's just a kind of a direct translation into JavaScript. And it looks pretty nice. I haven't used it myself, but, you know, if I wanted to write my JavaScript in Ruby, I could. <laughs> so how much Ruby do you need to, if someone's picking this up to create their site, do they need a lot of Ruby knowledge to get started with Bridgetown or is it kind of op- like optional way to if they want to add in other capability? It's actually totally optional. You could use Liquid if you wanted to, just like in Jekyll. And uh, there, there are other templating options as well, Hamel, Slim, and there's another one that's that's been built along with Bridgetown, I believe, called Serby. And so uh, there are options there. And uh, the only time you would need to use Ruby, I suppose, is if you wanted to build a, a component uh, like I did in my site. But you could, you know, you could do anything with JavaScript as well if you wanted to. Uh, just not not accessing the data in Bridgetown, I suppose. You would have to do that in Ruby. Gotcha. So, what was your big takeaway from going through this, going through this whole project? You know, kind of taking up this uh, software, putting your site together. What what things stuck out to you after having gone through it? There were a couple of things. Uh, Like I said, it was the most fun project I've done so far. And part of that is the the Ruby features that I mentioned uh, made it really fun. But also uh, because it's very simple and straightforward to build a static site. You know, even if you do some fancy things with it, it's refreshingly simple. I've been learning Rails these past few months and there have been a lot of headaches uh, that I've run into learning Rails <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that you don't run into with a static site, just be, you know, just because of the nature of working with a database and users and so on. So if I would if love to learn more on that, 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> if you, or I could go on for days, but if um, you know, nothing against rails, but no, just, I had a conversation similar to this with a coworker this morning. So yeah, yeah, rails is actually really nice, but it's you know, being a beginner at it is inevitably yeah um, headache yep. inducing. So, but anyway, it you know, you if your project is simple enough that you can do a static site. You know, if you just want to display data, even if you're getting it from somewhere else, if you don't need uh, different users, then a static site is great for that. Uh, no matter how much modern type features you need, you can add a lot of that in. Yeah. So that's that's one takeaway is that it was, uh, I found I could do quite a bit uh, while still keeping it simple. And another thing is is just that it Bridgetown was a great learning tool for me. And in the Ruby world, um, you know, for a, a beginner like myself, uh, the options are basically start with a command line app, which I did, and that was a good first step, and or you can do a Rails app. Um, and there's typically no in-between that people think of. But for me, building a Bridgetown site was a perfect in-between because, uh, you know, I, I knew Ruby well at that point, and I had built a site before, but now I wanted to build a site with Ruby. And yet I was a little bit intimidated by Rails still at that point. And so Bridgetown was a great way to to build a site and do it in Ruby. I like that. Yeah, that's a really good call out. Yeah. To get familiar with the the web format and the technologies and also to be able to use a little bit of Ruby along the way, you know, kind of build up optionally as you want to add that. That is does sound like a good learning path. Yeah, it was for me. One thing that I'm curious about with this, since it's a fork of Jekyll, is Jekyll had a pretty robust set of plugins that you could actually use with it. Do those still work? And or is there a similar set of plugins for Bridgetown that you can use? So Jekyll plugins uh, don't work in Bridgetown. Uh, so Bridgetown is going off on its own in its own direction. And Jekyll uh, plugins and Jekyll things will, won't necessarily work. Uh, in Bridgetown. There are a number of plugins already for Bridgetown, but not nearly as many, of course, mm-hmm. as there are for Jekyll. But that's another area where I hope uh, we'll see more growth themes and plugins, you know, as more people start using Bridgetown. Yeah. But I didn't find any lack of plugins myself, uh, though my, my site is admittedly simple. One other thing that I'm wondering about is you, you kind of created your own data source out of a CSV on Dropbox. But one thing that I've seen a lot of people do is they've used, and, and this is something you see a lot more with like a Gatsby or a Next.js or some of these others is they'll, they'll actually, it's a statically generated site and kind of has React sitting on top of it so that it can dynamically update itself and stuff like that. But It'll pull from a GraphQL or things like that. So can you pull from other sources other than like Markdown for Bridgetown? It's a good question. And one I'm not able to answer fully. However, I know that uh, the Bridgetown team is currently doing a lot of work integrating CMS into Bridgetown just so that it'll be easy to you know write your content on some of the popular CMS options and then link it up with, with your Bridgetown site. Uh, but that's all I know at this point, uh, that that in Bridgetown 1.0 or 1. Point something early, there, there will be CMS options. Okay. There. So you put your CSV file in Dropbox and you're accessing it that way. But did you do that as an exercise or do you need to do that? Would there have been a way to include that resource as part of your project and have it read directly from there? Yes, actually, that would have been possible. But in my case, I, I keep mine in Dropbox just because I I like keeping it in sync with everything. So, uh, you know, sometimes I edit my uh, reading list on my computer, sometimes on my phone. And so Dropbox is a convenient place for me to have it in one place uh, and then, you know, just access it uh, from different places from there. And so I could have had it in directly in my Bridgetown site, but uh, that would have made editing it more complicated. Okay, you you did that so you can manage the data more readily, and then just have Bridgetown read from it. Yeah. Down. So my my reading list is uh, something I edit directly as a CSV. Mm-hmm. There's actually a really neat uh, VS Code plugin called Rainbow CSV that 
high like color codes your CSV columns. Mm. And so you can edit it as a plain text file basically uh, really easily. So that's what I that's what I do. And uh, so I just edit edit the CSV directly and then appears on my site and so on. Cool. So now your site's out in the world. What are, what actually are you blogging about? I don't know if we asked you that. It sounds like you've got a reading list. So are you giving people book recommendations or book reviews or what are you blogging about? Well, um, my reading list is mainly for myself. And also, you know, I sometimes want to to share what I'm reading with friends and editing a, a CSV reading list is uh, not going to cut it when you want to share it with friends. You know, you're not going to give them this massive uh, CSV. So that's why I built the reading list. Uh, I don't do reviews or anything, just take notes and keep track of it there because I often f- actually forget what I read unless I take notes. Uh, but as far as what I've been blogging about, um, uh, ever since last summer when I started my developer transition, I've tried to blog about something new I learn every month. And so in the beginning, it was uh, not always coding, but these days I'm learning Rails. And so it's Rails centric these days and more Ruby as well. So uh, you'll, if you want, you can read about more of the headaches that I mentioned uh, that I'll be, that I'll be <laughs> blogging about uh, Rails headaches. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it sounds like you're like myself in that if I don't write something down, I'll never, ever remember to do it. So my problem is I've got too many different lists on a hundred different places where I got to write stuff I need to do. Yeah, that was my <laughs> problem with my reading list, actually, and taking notes as I read. I would always keep my n- notes for this book here and this other book there, and I would end up losing my notes uh, sometimes when my notes were really valuable for me, and that was frustrating. So uh, now I actually keep my reading notes in my reading CSV file as part of my reading list, just as a separate column. And of course, that the column is not shown by, uh, you know, shown out on the uh, reading list on my site, but you can expand the items right. and see my notes and such. Yeah. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And lately, I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts and in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships and how to build their careers and max out and and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, Go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. Yeah, knock on wood. Like if something ever would happen to like the disc on my laptop or my (laughs) Mac, like the thing that I would miss the most, because mostly the code is checked yeah. in, like maybe I missed a little bit of changes I did that day. But like, if it's just notes I've been taking that I haven't checked into the repo, like that's what I would, that's what I would truly miss. So getting back to your Rails frustrations. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Are we, we going to get into it? <laughs> Let's go. Right, so, so you've started this blog. This is a static side generator with Bridgetown. You, you've made a gem. So you... You you've let you've gotten on the Ruby bandwagon, and now you go and and try out Rails. <laughs> yeah, where, where are the pain points as a newbie coming in with some Ruby experience that you have now? Right, where did you start hitting those pain points? What what are your uh, November of WTFs? Yeah, good way, <laughs> good way to put it. And I'm actually writing a blog post on that very question right now. It's called... Don't spoil too much. (laughs) I know, we might have to have you back. (laughs) Spoil a little bit. I'll try to be brief, but uh, it's it's called The Hard Parts of Learning Rails. Because, you know, in my my blog post a couple months ago, on on my first month of Rails, I, I built my app in a month. Of course, it wasn't quite finished, but it was usable. And so I, I built that and it was all, you know, upbeat and cheery, like, hey, I did this in a month. It was great. But I sort of left out the some of the other side uh, where I was, you know, like banging my head against the wall at certain points, which happens often, whatever kind of learner you are. But as a 
as a self learner, sometimes you you just have to figure things out, and that's a painful process. So, you know, Felipe, I bet if you ask Valentino nicely, he'll give you permission to title your blog post the November of Rails hey, WTFs. That's, <laughs> that's a good title, yeah. Great, great artist steal. It's a good, a, a good clickbait <laughs> yep. title. <laughs> True. Uh, no, but I I do enjoy Rails, but there are certain things that are just hard and or confusing for beginners. Let me see the big ones. For me, there are three. Let's pick three that are the hardest. Number one is authentication. And it's not, you know, not confusing or difficult as much as kind of um, cumbersome uh, for a beginner. I did did Michael Hargill's Ruby on Rails tutorial Mm -hmm. um, after I built my app in the first month. We should have him back on. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. But, uh, you know, the, f- the first 12 out of 14 chapters are essentially building the authentication system. And it's great to learn that. Uh, I'm really glad I, I know. But I'm also glad I didn't start with the Rails tutorial as my very first tutorial because it's, uh, you know, it's a long process <laughs> to set up authentication. So which path did you decide to go down with authentication? For my app, I actually switched to Sorcery, the Sorcery gem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it works well because my authentication is pretty simple. And, and I like Sorcery, too, because you can also control the authentication flow pretty well. I haven't used Devise myself, but I sort of I was drawn towards Sorcery just because I, I did want to understand the authentication flow, but also not have to write out the implementation that makes sense what made you steer away from the rails basic authentication stuff do you mean the approach that's in the rails tutorial yeah like in the rails guides yeah Uh, i actually haven't read the rails guides on authentication so it's possible that i'm missing something i'll have to catch up on that okay i mean that's interesting that you missed it uh because it should be part of the setup process Hmm. that's interesting Um, yeah So reading through the Rails guides is next on my list. I haven't, I didn't even know actually there was a a built-in way to do authentication because on the, in the Rails tutorial, you know, there are times when I was uh, following along and, and reaching into bcrypt and things like stuff like that. And it was, it was a bit, (laughs) it was getting a bit tricky for me. I mean, this is, this is kind of important, right? Like here you are trying to test out Rails for the first time. And, you know, there are features that you just don't know about, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so maybe maybe reading through the Rails guides should be earlier on in my path, actually. Well, <laughs> you can't blame it on the Rails guides, too. <laughs> I, sure you so, can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm blaming uh, myself for not doing that first. Authentication is still hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. But sorcery, the sorcery gem, it works out well for me. It's simple and flexible as well. Uh, you know, I just have to do have to do one method call for remember me rather than all this extra stuff. So authentication was a bit of a pain point, but I might have to revise that. I'll keep it in here for, for uh, you know, just for the record, but I might edit my post to point people to a better way. As an application, I'm going to step back for a second. As an application developer, security to me has always seemed like one of those things that just really should be simple. Like, it really shouldn't be that hard. Like, okay, who are you? What can you do? Like, come on, like, how, how hard is it? But in practice, it gets to be so gnarly. And it's just so far from like the mental model. Now, I'm sure there's a bunch of security engineers that are sitting there going, that application stuff is so easy. Why can't those guys do it <laughs> better? You know? All right. But, I, but I, <laughs> so maybe it's, uh, you know, I don't know what I don't know. But it just always seems to me like security should be should be easier. I've used device in the in the past, and I don't remember too many hurdles with it. So I, Felipe, it might be something you want to yeah. check out. But yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, I love the built-in authentication for sure. Other than building it out myself, another pain point for me has been Active Record and just working with the database in general. Because uh, you know, after doing Ruby for a year, I'm used to just you know, here's a hash, here's an array, I can do whatever I want with it. Whereas in Rails or any other framework, you're carefully treading <laughs> around the database. You don't want to 
hit the database too often and you, you want to know where your queries are are executing and and so on and that's not always clear to a beginner how all that is happening you know active record is sort of abstracted away in a way that's convenient but not always clear to a beginner so so what parts of it specifically did you struggle with for active record well there were there were just some concepts and processes that were were and actually still are unclear in some cases like uh, you know when you when you pull an object from the database how long does it persist in memory and uh, and you know what at one at what point is it do I have to get it from the database again and that sort of thing and I'm sure these things will come to me with time but it would be nice if as a beginner there were there were a, a sort of guide to using active record wisely <laughs> without hitting your database a billion times which actually was the case when I first built my app like the the page to show the reading list so my app is essentially my my reading list page from my blog just translated into an app with you know so that anyone can set up their own so my page to show the reading list took a while to load you know even if you had just a few dozen items or a few hundred it took quite a while and i could see in the log you know this stream of uh, database interactions and so i knew there was something wrong there but i wasn't sure at first what it was and so i i read after i did the rails tutorial it was a little more clear that i had to optimize my queries and and you know make sure that i'm not hitting my database uh, repeatedly and sort of lump things together so it was i just needed to sort of understand that concept so that was that's one thing and another thing is indexing. That's another sort of difficult concept for a beginner. Caching as well, like when, yeah, just all, all the sort of finding the balance between, between memory and, and uh, performance, I guess, is a, a tricky one for a beginner. Do you want to take it out from your database again, or do you want to save it here or, or whatever? Yeah. So, Valentino, is this the same list as your WTF? <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely aligns with some of the in, intro rail setup stuff for sure. Uh, there, there's definitely a uh, uh, there's obviously a huge hole here, right? With getting started with Rails, I think that's definitely what was prompting the May of you know WTFs, <laughs> which I'm glad there's some been some great stuff that's come out of that, obviously, but there's always room to improve. And, you know, hearing a new, somebody new to Rails that struggled with it, you know, how can we make it better? Yeah, there's a lot of detailed information and detailed guys. I wonder if some of the gap maybe is like kind of a, in the introductory, like here's the roadmap or here's the landscape of what all of the different pieces are. And just so you have that kind of mental model and then, okay, what do I need to dive into in a little more detail and just knowing what's there and how what I'm doing fits in into the overall design. I think when I first started with Rails quite a while ago, that was maybe something that I kind of felt like I stumbled on a little bit. The I haven't gone through the starter guys in a while, so that may have changed. But Yeah, just the concept of working with a database. You know, what is a database? How should you work with it? How shouldn't you work with it is really helpful to know <laughs> as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, you hear the performance yeah. issues most people have. It's database, right? Typically, your, you know, Rails or Ruby is not really the thing slowing you down. It's database and not indexing right or querying too much. And then, like you said, the second part is caching. <laughs> not, not caching enough or caching too much and making things expire too quickly. Yeah, but there is one other area, and I, I don't, it's hard to say whether this one maybe gave me more headaches than everything else combined, and that is JS bundling. For Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a beginner. Uh, I JS feel you there, is, man. It's so mysterious. Like, I still, I, I still struggle to understand it, even the basics, and... So when, when I, whenever I run into JS bundling issues, I groan and wonder how long this will take to <laughs> fix. So the first roadblock that I ran into was that my app got build errors on Heroku from Webpack. This was, mm -hmm. I was using Rails 6. And I tried finding out what the issue was. I couldn't figure it out. 
So this was a few days after the announcement about uh, new methods yes, for build. bundling. Yeah. yeah. In Rails 7. And so I thought, wow, this is perfect timing. I could just switch to one of these new things and it'll be simple and great. What could go wrong? Um, <laughs> and it did work. It did work. I didn't get build errors on Heroku anymore. But I tried to import maps first. And I like the simplicity of an import map. But at first, my JS wasn't working at all. And worked on it for a long time, couldn't figure it out. Eventually, I upgraded to Rails 7 Alpha, and that fixed it. And that worked for a while. But then after a few weeks, I, I was customizing my turbo page transitions a bit. And my import map wasn't cooperating with that. And so it actually took a while to f- figure out that an underlying issue with Turbo or like the that it, Turbo was causing the issue and then that import maps was also causing me not to be able to fix the Turbo issue. And finally, I switched to ES build and that, I hope, is a happy ending uh, to that story. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I tried, seems like I tried everything. So at least I, I learned the different approaches. See, the way the way that I solved my JavaScript problems was I, I just stopped using JavaScript. <laughs> now, if I can if I can stay in Ruby longer, like why would I want to like leave Ruby? Sorry, I was trying to channel my inner Luke because Luke couldn't be here today, so I was trying to think about yeah. like what would Luke. Well, say? speaking of that, I joined the <laughs> Stimulus Reflex Discord channel, and I haven't gotten into Stimulus Reflex yet or Hotwire, but the uh, people on the Discord channel were so helpful to me, have been, and still are. You know, over the past few weeks, mm-hmm. I. I didn't even have stimulus reflex questions, just you know, random bundling and front end questions. And yet they answered my every question and sometimes stayed with me over several days of related questions. Uh, it's blown my mind um, how how that goes. You know, these people helping me as a random stranger. It's been great. Uh, I didn't really see what people meant by the friendliness of the Ruby community till then. And also another good example of that is you all who invited me on the show, despite my not being an expert in it, anything in particular. You know more about Bridgetown <laughs> than we do. That's why we brought you on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, and those guys over at uh, Stimulus Reflex, most of them, most of the guys that have worked on that were panelists on the show at one point. Yeah, I saw that. I noticed. Is this an entry point? <laughs> Are Darren and I uh, destined to be Stimulus <laughs> Reflex <laughs> maintainers? Uh, you're going to invent something else. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but Bridgetown Reflex. There we go. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so that's that's my travails and lows and rails so far. Good deal. One thing that I did want to mention, speaking of rails, though, is that uh, in Bridgetown's 1.0 release coming up soon, they are adding a, a really neat possibility for a hybrid architecture where you can have server-side rendering alongside your static uh, Bridgetown site. And I haven't tried it myself, and I don't know a whole lot of concepts involved, so don't ask me for details. But it will be possible to mount a Rails app or Sinatra or whatever alongside your Bridgetown site in Rack and sort of have them work together like that. But also Bridgetown is incorporating some uh, dynamic routing that will be you know, built in. So uh, it works with Rota API, I think. So you can just have a, have a dynamic route set up in the header of your template file. And so for example, if for my reading list page on my site, if I wanted to, using that approach, I could have a sort of URL based filter, where if the, you know, if I, if I went to slash reading slash top five novels, or slash 2019 or whatever, then the uh, then my site would look at that handle and sort of construct a filter based on it and show show only the items in my list that correspond to the the URL. So that's one example how that would work. But uh, I'm sure there are other interesting ways to do dynamic routes in a static site. Cool. That sounds really interesting. Well, so, uh, Felipe, what are you looking forward to next? Well, keep working on my Rails app. It's on my homepage. I, I say that I'm, I'm working on making my Rails app less terrible just because <laughs> uh, 
you know, a Rails app built by someone who's only been working in Rails for a couple months is not going to be pretty and painful, even for myself. So working on that, I'm working through my uh, study guide, which is like my way of keeping track of my learning uh, in lieu of, you know, formal boot camp or whatever. So that will help me know what to do in Rails better and, and uh, know how not to scare people away the first moment they look at my app's code base. And so I'm looking forward to that. And also looking forward to the job search. I know that, yeah, I actually don't know what to expect in the job search because I've, I've heard different things about <laughs> Rails beginners job search. So we'll see how it is. Cool. Well, hopefully you find a job. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird market. I've talked to a whole bunch of people. I just barely made a job transition. And for senior folks, it's like there there are a lot of people looking. But for junior folks, sometimes it people are looking and sometimes it's hard to find stuff. And it just depends on what people need, what they're willing to accept and how much training they're willing to do. So, yeah, for those that I was going to say, for those out there hiring, you can waste six months training a junior or mentoring a junior and spend the same amount of time looking and hiring a senior. So it's definitely worth the time hiring Felipe here and mentoring him, getting him on board and, you know, setting him up. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I don't find something immediately, I won't be super disappointed because I, going into Ruby, I, you know, I was aware that it's not the most popular choice for beginners and might take me longer to find my first job, but that's okay. You know, I have my, I have my day job and I'm having fun learning Ruby in the evenings, so I'm I can be in it for the long haul, no problem. Yeah, I I have feelings about this, and I'm just going to briefly uh, state them. I mean, Valentino was kind of uh, nicely putting out there my feelings, uh, but my feelings are essentially if you can't find a senior, then you really ought to hire a junior that is eager to learn. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that you are hurting yourself if you aren't willing to do that. You know, there are some circumstances, you know, where you may not have somebody who can mentor them along. And it, so that may be a judgment call you have to make. But most people that I've found that are hungry to figure this stuff out, yeah, you bring them in for three to six months and then they're contributing on a level that moves you along on a regular basis. And the the other part of Valentino's point, or you can spend six months hiring a senior if you can find one in six months. And in this market, that's that's an ask, right? Unless you just have a killer reputation, killer benefits, killer salary. It's just, it's getting harder. So the other thing is you can teach them to do it the way that you want it done. It, anyway, I'm not going to say that you're stupid to try and do it the other way if you're having trouble finding a senior, but you're kind of being stupid to do it the other way. But yeah, the the other thing is, is that, yeah, there are plenty of people out there that are smart and eager, like Felipe. And yeah, so anyway, that's my feeling. Why why pass them up? You know, bring them in, teach them to do it, pay them what they're worth. That's the other thing is, is I have people come to me and they're like, well, we train them up. And then once they have a year's worth of experience, you know, they start looking for another job. And I'm like, well, yeah, because once they have a year's worth of experience, you got to pay them more. But they're that much more valuable. So if you if you train them, you treat treat them well, you take care of them, you make sure you pay them what they're worth, they'll stick around just like anybody else, right? So yeah, folks like this are worth the investment. Anyway, I will stop preaching and I will move us on to picks. Yeah, I appreciate the thoughts. And actually, I'm curious, I wonder if you all have more insight on this. Are companies not as willing to hire juniors because they just don't have a, a setup for onboarding juniors and mentoring them? And so is that why they look for seniors just because they're set up to accept seniors more easily? Or is it is it because there aren't as many juniors out there and so it's harder to find an exceptional junior? Or maybe, it, I don't know if this is a chicken or the egg kind of problem, like what, what came first to make hiring juniors less uh, common? I think it's mostly that these companies just want to not have to do the work to get people contributing at the level they want them contributing. And I think also a lot of companies mistakenly have the idea that in order to get the kind of work done that they want done, they need a senior developer to do it. Honestly, the the real telling thing for uh, high quality development work has more to do with the developer's willingness to go learn new things and their development practices than it does with level level of experience. Now, 
there are certain things that a, an experienced developer will instinctively do or instinctively know that uh, a less experienced developer won't. And so you do want to have some of them around, but you don't need your whole team to be those people. There was a while too where companies that hit a hyper growth phase, they had it in their heads that they needed a senior stack of engineers to propel them forward. I don't know if that's changed or (laughs) what brought that about. Because to me, really, you should be hiring a junior dev for every senior dev. And pairing and mentoring should kind of be built into your company, right? (laughs) Because junior devs become senior devs. (laughs) I think that's extremely effective, actually. I've read some things also that companies, a lot of companies aren't in the mindset of keeping devs over the long term because it's so common for developers to just sort of bounce from one thing to the next. So I wonder if that also plays into it. That's that's definitely a possibility. But then that is a chicken and the egg kind of a thing, right? Because if companies are acting like the developers are going to leave, then the developers are going to leave. And then the developers leaving are going to reinforce that the developers are going to leave and therefore they're going to act like the developers are going to leave. I don't know. I don't think that's a healthy way for a company to look at their developers because every time you have somebody leave and trust me, I'm seeing this at the place that I am currently leaving. Every time you have somebody walk out the door, you have a ton of institutional knowledge walk out the door with them. I mean, we we on Monday, Monday was the last day for another guy that just left and he'd been working on this project that we've been porting over to rails for years and now we're we're actually trying to reverse engineer stuff that we were just asking him questions about before and they couldn't figure out he was he was a contractor they couldn't figure out how to pay him i mean is that insane or what you know they couldn't figure out how to get him paid because he was in another country and so we lost him and and how many developer hours is that going to cost them to to just have that institutional knowledge gone it, it's that it, and it and you see that all the time and it's not just international folks it's not just longtime employees that walk out the door i mean anybody who's around that's worked on things for a few months has institutional knowledge that you want to hold on to they have skills that are specific to that application and it's crazy to let them go they're more valuable to you than they are to anybody else anyway like i said i could i could hammer on this forever because i see i see people do this all the time and it's so short-sighted and then and then they wonder why they have issues come up that could have been avoided. Anyway, let's do picks because, yeah. <laughs> hey, folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. Darren, do you want to start us off with picks? I can do that. So I think this will actually be topical. I just stumbled upon a market survey of Ruby on Rails developers, and this was done by Zipia, which uh, is a career site and career services. So you can take a look at all the, the stats and the numbers. A few interesting things did stand out to me. According to their survey, it is a majority of uh, males versus females that identify as Ruby Rails developers. However, the encouragingly, the pay gap, well, I, is is smaller than I thought it might be. It was ninety six cents on a dollar, so we need to get that to be where it's equal. But uh, it was, that seemed like an encouraging stat from what I saw. You can also find some interesting things. You know, what degree do folks have? So I'm in the thirteen percent who have a master's degree. There, I did note that there was 1% of the Rails developers who have PhDs, those poor people that got their PhD, or maybe they're happy. Maybe they just discovered Rails and now love it like we do, and, and they're good to go. So, But there's some uh, interesting information, and it kind of dovetails in with what we've been talking about. So it's there for you to check out. Nice. My mom got her master's degree, and I asked her if we should be calling her master. She, she kind of implied that we should have been doing that already, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's a long overdue, huh? (laughs) Anyway, Valentino, what are your picks? So I've got a pick here. One of my coworkers, Fabio Rem, made this great. There's there's a gem letter opener from way back when, from Ryan Bates. Let's you kind of get insights into your Rails emails. And my coworker, Fabio, kind of made a better web upgrade of it since it hasn't been maintained in a while. 
And I recommend everybody checking it out. Uh, he did some stellar work kind of making it easy to, to see an inbox. So check that out. I, I thought I had something else, but <laughs> drawn a blank. I guess RubyConf uh, just wrapped up. I'm looking forward. I, I wasn't able to attend this year. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all the great stuff. Go play with Ruby 3.1. It's previews out. Nice. I'm going to throw out some picks. Uh, we were talking about authentication, and I've been working on top-end devs. And so uh, what we opted for, or what I opted for, was real easy to set up for my for authentication on that, was Auth0. So anyways, third-party authentication system. The thing that I liked about it was, yeah, uh, all that security stuff, it was way easy because I just set up Auth0. I just, you know, I just, uh, I think it uses OmniAuth in the, and then it's a, an authentication strategy on OmniAuth. So you just pull it in that way. And then, yeah, all the third party apps, you just set them up in OmniAuth and it's, it's a SaaS app that you just pull in. I'm trying to decide the best strategy to take payments, right? To have paid accounts. And so it looks like I'm probably just gonna have to have people authenticate and then pay, which isn't that uncommon. But uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm kind of figuring that bit out, but I'm really liking it. It's it's pretty nice. It's super fully featured. That's the only part of it I don't like is that I'm a little overwhelmed with all of the ridiculous number of features that it has. A couple of other things I'm just going to throw out there. So top end devs through the end of uh, November. Yeah, I'm, lo- I'm doing a pre-launch sale up through basically when I start this new thing, the end of November. But yeah, you can get the pre-launch. It'll be 50% off. I'm going to be putting together some one or two hour live courses that will then be part of the membership. And then I'm putting together community. I I really want it to be like the full on what you need in order to succeed in your career, not just, hey, here's some courses. Good luck. Right. So community, live training, courses, ongoing teaching, you know, all the things that you need. So come check us out. The podcasts are listed on there now, topendevs.com. And uh, yeah. If, if you have an interest in being an author, topendevs.com slash author. If you want uh, career coaching, topendevs.com slash coaching. And yeah, if you want to help out in some other way, let me know. But uh, I am I'm just super fired up about this. And I'm also super fired up to be out of this position that I've, I've I kind of indirectly complained about some of the issues that they have just because, you know, some of the things that we talked about that are issues in workplaces are definitely issues where I have been. So anyway, those are my picks. Felipe, what are your picks? Well, if if I may, I would just like to make one final plug for the Bridgetown 1.0 release. They are currently mm-hmm. fundraising. Uh, it's a very small project with a pretty small budget, but uh, they still need help. So if you're looking for a project to sponsor, you can go to fundraising.bridgetownrb.com. Cool. And then if people want to hire you, Hopefully we talk to people into at least thinking about it. Sure, yeah. Just head to my website, fpsvogel.com, and you'll see the links there. All right, good deal. Well, thank you for coming. This was really Thanks cool. So much. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, like I said, I was delighted to, to be on the show despite my lack of expertise. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, no problem. I just want to speak to that for a minute because you know you knew what you were talking about, and a lot of times I hear that when I invite people or, you know, when Michaela invites people, we get back, uh, well, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to be on the show. And the reality is, is that, hey, you know, we're here, we're talking about Ruby, we're talking about Rails, we're talking about whatever we're talking about, but you know more than us, and we are happy to have your expertise. And to be honest, your journey is just as interesting to us as Bridgetown or anything else. So thanks for coming and just sharing you and your journey with us. Yeah, very happy to do it. I had fun. All right. Well, until next time, folks, Max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.